We're going to be in Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Dear Holy Father, we do pray that you'll bless us today. Bless the preaching of thy word. The hindrances this morning, God, I do pray, will be focused upon the word of God. We thank you, Father, for your goodness and for the Holy Bible. Preservation of thy word, thy Holy Spirit. The wonderful grace and mercy you've had for us, God. Now I do pray that you'll speak to folks today, Lord. In the name of the Lord Jesus, amen. Title my message is False Accusers Beware. Solomon says, go sit down. Solomon says, Therefore I hated life, because the work that is wrought under the sun is grievous unto me, for all is vanity and vexation of spirit. He says in verse 18, Yea, I hated all my labor which I had taken under the sun, because I should leave it unto a man that shall be after me. Therefore I went about to cause my heart to despair of all the labor which I took under the sun. For God giveth to a man that is good in his sight wisdom and knowledge and joy, but to the sinner he giveth travail. Last week we found out that life without obedience to God is vanity and vexation of spirit. We learn in the scriptures that when we live for this life only, it leads to unhappiness. When you love anything or anyone more than God, it becomes a devil or at least a cause of despair. I want you to understand something today. It's not wrong to love good things. You can love sleep. But God says that when you love something in a bad sense, it means that you're loving either the wrong thing or certain things above or more than God. So notice Proverbs 20, verse 13. You've got a scripture that says that the sleep of a laboring man is precious, is sweet. But Proverbs 20 says, love not sleep, lest thou come to poverty. When it says love not sleep, it means don't love it beyond or more than you should. Proverbs 21 says, he that loveth pleasure shall be a poor man, but he that loveth wine and oil shall not be rich. What does that mean? Does it mean that you're not supposed to like the taste of olive oil? No. It means that when you love eating, when you love pleasure, even wholesome good pleasures more than God, that's when they're out of line. And this is explained in 2 Timothy 3. In the last days they will be lovers of pleasures. Is it wrong to love sleep? Wrong to love oil? Wrong to love good things? No. It says they'll be lovers of pleasures, and notice these words, more than lovers of God. So the good things that you are to enjoy in this life, when you love them more than you should, and certainly when you love them more than God, that's what's wrong. Even people. Look at Matthew chapter 10. He that loveth father or mother, you're supposed to love your father and mother, but it says he that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. There it is. When you apply that to this life, you learn that you are to love life, but in the proper order of value. You're not to love life in this world more than you love eternal life, or even life in the world to come, the millennium. And you're certainly not to love your lives more than God. Look at John 12. He that loveth his life shall lose it. But he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. Look at Luke 14. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also... He cannot be my disciple. This is all completely understood when you look back again at, Mark, at Matthew chapter 10. It says, He that loveth father or mother more than me, and there is the key. 
There is the key. Loving your family is not wrong. It's when your loves are not properly prioritized. Likewise, loving life is not wrong. The only way to truly love others and truly love your life itself is to prioritize your loves. That means don't love your life more than God. Don't love your life in this world more than you love life in the coming kingdom or eternity. So this is the point of Solomon. When he lived for pleasure, as he describes at the beginning of chapter 2, when he lived for laughter and money and hobbies, when all these things were out of order in his life, it led to despair. And it says plainly, he hated life and he hated all his labor. But when you put God first, when you put other things that are more important first, then you discover the wonderful paradox of Scripture. Our Lord says when you seek the kingdom of God, when you seek first the kingdom of God, all these other things shall be added unto you. So your clothes, your food, the cares, the things that you need, the things that God gives you to enjoy, They are not to be put first. That is the Christian's principle, and that is the key to a balanced life. Solomon finally learned how to truly love life, and he has given you his wisdom based upon the wisdom God gave him and the experience that he discovered with this wisdom. He did not find out till he was very old And he appeals throughout this book, don't make the mistake I made. I don't have any years to enjoy this secret that I found, this key that's been right here before me the whole time. Don't don't do what I did. Don't waste all these years trying to find happiness in the wrong things with your life all imbalanced and out of order. So last week we found Solomon's first answer to how to love life at the end of chapter 2, and he says, make your soul enjoy good. Labor for God with all your might. Fear God and keep His commandments. Be thankful and quit wasting your life murmuring and sighing. This same thing is said different ways throughout the Bible with more details. This is what I want to focus on today. Solomon in Ecclesiastes, and certainly in the book of Proverbs, is going to put great stress on your tongue and what you say as a major key to whether you will love life or not. Let's examine some of these verses as well as others. Look in Proverbs chapter 18. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Think about that now. Jesus says, hate your life, but he meant in the context, he meant don't love your life in the wrong way, out of balance. But Solomon says that death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it, love what? Love love life. You're supposed to love life. They that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. 1 Peter puts it this way, quoting from the Psalms that we'll read momentarily. It says in 1 Peter 3, he that will love life. He that will love life. But the Lord Jesus says that you have to hate your life. But our Lord Jesus, understanding the scriptures, being God himself, is plainly explaining this priority, this order. God wants you to love life, but you can't love life by getting out of God's will and not acknowledging Him and not putting Him first and loving other things and pleasures ahead of God. He that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil, the first thing, and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. So according to the Holy Ghost, quoting Peter here, we find that if you want to love life, Solomon said, fear God and keep His commandments. Make your soul enjoy good in your labor. But to say it another way, Peter says, if you want to love life, make sure your lips speak no guile.
The original psalm is Psalms 34. Come ye children, hearken to me, and I will teach you the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord? Verse 12, what man is he that desireth life and loveth many days that he may see good? Now how in the world is the fear of God connected with desiring life, loving life? There's an obvious connection here. What man is he that desireth life, loveth many days that he may see good? Here it is. Here's the key. Verse 13. Keep thy tongue from evil and thy lips from speaking guile. I tell you what. You start speaking evil with your tongue. You start getting out of order with your tongue. You're not going to love life, brother. You're going to hate life. You don't learn to control your tongue and get that tongue straight. You probably already do hate life. Because it's your mouth. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. What is this guile? that David and Peter speak of here, the Holy Ghost. The guile is deceit. The major key to loving life, according to Solomon, is making sure you don't speak evil with your mouth. He says in Ecclesiastes, don't be rash with thy mouth. He says in chapter 10 of Ecclesiastes, the lips of a fool will swallow up himself. So you're not going to love life if you don't watch your tongue, watch your lips, watch your mouth. No wonder people are so depressed today. A major, major reason for their depression is their tongue. They got wicked tongues. They've got gossiping tongues. They've got tongues that sow discord. They got tongues that like to cause problems. They got tongues that cannot respect authority. Notice how the Bible says people will live in these last days. 2 Timothy 3, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. Lovers of their own selves? Again, all out of balance, all out of priority, all, all wrong. Disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. Now don't miss this. Verse 3, false accusers and despisers of those that are good, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. God says a major problem in the last days. One reason the times will be very perilous is that there will be false accusers. They will be despisers of those that are good. Think about this for me, please. In the last days, they will be false accusers. Sometimes we skip over that. Do not miss this. A major sign of the last days is false accusation. But these people love themselves more than they should, more than God, more than others. They love pleasures more than God, all out of order, more than they should. But notice, they're full of false accusation and despising those that are good. False accusation and despising those that are good. I want you to sink in here. According to the Bible, if a man or woman is good, sooner or later, to whatever degree, you may be certain that he or she will be despised. And because they are despised, they're going to be hated and they're going to be falsely accused. You're living in the last days. If you're living in the last days and you're good and what God says is good, in the way God says is good. If you are good in the way God says is good, 
the way Solomon tells you to be good, you will be despised and you will be falsely accused. And then once accused, the insects will come crawling out of the woodwork in mass. Everybody who secretly despised you, everybody who envied you, everybody that you have rebuked, everybody that has made a failure of their life and grown bitter and resentful in their pride, everyone that hates you for rebuking in the gate, everybody will come out to enjoy the carnage. You better get this straight. All that will live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And one of the major ways that you will be persecuted is to be falsely accused by those who despise you the same reason Cain despised Abel. Now, this is important. I don't want to tell you this just so you will not be surprised when it happens to you I need you to also understand this for another reason, and that is when good men and good women are accused in your generation, do not be one of those that fails to give them charity and due process and proper justice. I have been absolutely amazed at the climate in which we live. I have been absolutely amazed at the state of Christians today. Their inability to understand the times we're living in. Their inability to give due process. Their willingness to believe evil and slander about a brother or sister with no investigation, with no due process, with no biblical order, the Salem witch trials were led by devils against good people. The hysteria. Good people got involved in this hysteria. And they weren't good once they got involved. Later they were ashamed. Later some of the judges, they all bowed their heads and they said, I cannot believe what happened to me. How did I, how, how did I get involved in accusing these good people? The best people in the town were accused of being witches. The devils made sure because they were listening to devils. They, they did not give due process. They listened to devils. It was all out of order. And the devil says, yes, Miss so-and-so, Mr. So-and-so, go get him. And of course, the devils went after the best Christians in the town. They were willing to murder in this hysteria. The same wicked, devil-possessed hysteria is at the forefront of the sodomite homosexual movement today. Wherever these people lurk, whether in the closet or out, they're going to lie in wait to falsely accuse a righteous man. Wherever there's a secret sodomite, wherever there's a sodomite spirit, you are in danger. The Bible says they hate him that rebukes in the gate. The Bible says they lay a snare. They make a man an offender for a word. And it's also a wicked and adulterous generation with a Jezebel spirit. Where there's adultery, you will have good men accused. This is biblical. I've talked to preachers that have been accused of the most malicious, ungodly things for years, sometimes 30, 40 years, by a man who was caught in adultery. And that man has had that bitterness and has not repented of his sin. And this, I'm not talking about one church. I'm talking about multiple pastors I can name right now who almost had ministries destroyed by wicked, adulterous men and women. You find sodomites and, and, and hey, praise God for any that repent. And we call people to repent. But I'm also telling you, God says, beware of dogs. Beware of those that go back to their vomit. Beware of a believer who goes back to the things of this world because they will bite you. And one of the ways they bite is false accusation. 
You better get this straight, church of God, and whoever's listening to this sermon today. If you don't want to, if you don't believe the danger of a Jezebel spirit, I tell you what, you get a woman out of her place puffed up and filled with that Jezebel spirit of witchcraft and domination. You let her get that masculine, wicked, witchcraft spirit. And I'm going to tell you, here's what's going to happen. There was a righteous man that would not surrender his vineyard to Jezebel. Jezebel says, I know what to do. 1 Kings 21, set two men, sons of Belial, before him to bear witness against him, saying, Thou did blaspheme God and the king, and then carry him out and stone him that he may die. Why did they kill Naboth? Some people said, to get his vineyard. They wanted his vineyard. Jezebel hated him. Other people said, no, no, that man, I, I heard the two witnesses. The two witnesses said, no, no, Naboth was a wicked man. He blasphemed God and he gets spread all over Facebook of the time. He's wicked. No, that man blasphemed God. He, he had two witnesses. Really? Did he cross-examine his witnesses? Did he get a chance to get due process to cross-examine his witnesses? No, that was a conspiracy against this man to get his vineyard. In the Bible, the vineyard is a picture of your family. You better listen to me today. If you do not surrender your family to Jezebel and the Jezebel spirit, you will be in danger, great danger of false accusation by the Jezebel spirit. Who did Jezebel mainly hate? Elijah. What was the Elijah spirit? Elijah will come to turn fathers back to their children and children to their fathers. You better listen to me. You either surrender your vineyard to Jezebel or get ready for persecution. Now, when that Jezebel spirit joins with that Sodomite spirit, and they already were joined together. They were already joined together. When that Sodomite and Jezebel adulterous spirit joins together, you would not believe the wrath that they are going to unleash upon good men and good women. And we expect that, and our Lord told us that it would happen, especially in the last days. But what amazes me is the Christians, the so-called Christians that join together with the Sodomite Jezebel spirit and believe accusations against good men. Shame on you. The Bible says, Proverbs 26, a lying tongue hateth those that are afflicted by it. The more you falsely accuse someone, the more you're going to hate them. You better listen to me, children. You deceive your papa. You deceive your mama. You're going to begin to hate them. It's human nature. You deceive your husband. You're going to learn to hate him. You're going to feel hatred in your heart. You deceive your wife, you'll begin to hate her. Not only in the act of lying, not only in your lying tongue, but it will come in your heart. It's going to be increased the more you accuse. And I'm going to tell you, you're not only hurting others, you're hurting yourself. Because you're growing darker. And you're going to experience future judgments from God. And you're going to be cursed in this life. One of the things you're going to be cursed with is despair and hatred of life. A false accuser hates life. A false accuser turns to alcohol and drugs many times. A false accuser cannot deal with life. Not only because of their conscience. But the Bible says plainly here, if you will love life, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking guile. What's guile? Deception, deceit, lies. If you falsely accuse somebody, you're going to hate life. So the title of this message is a False Accusers Beware. I'm telling you, you got judgment from God coming, but in your very act of false accusation, you are cursing yourself. Not only are you growing more hateful, but I'm telling you something right now, you're not going to love life. You will not be a happy camper. You will not have the joy of the Lord in your life. And go ahead. I don't care who joins hands with you and who pats you on the back and who has pity for you. In your false accusation, you are going to hate life. My God says so.
Psalms 31 says, Pull me out of the net that they have laid privily for me, for thou art my strength. Into thy hand I commit my spirit. The Lord Jesus quoted this on the cross. Hey, listen to me. The Lord had been falsely accused. He died for your sins. He had no sins of his own. And to murder him, they falsely accused him. But the Bible says their witnesses agreed not together. He did not get due process. See, Thou hast redeemed me, O Lord God of truth. I have hated them that regard lying vanities, but I trust in the Lord. Oh, well, if you are hating them that regard lying vanities, if you are, not, if you are standing for righteousness, they're going to hate you and you're going to receive false accusation. He says, I have heard the slander of many. Fear was on every side while they took counsel together against me. They devised to take away my life, but I trusted in thee, O Lord. I said, thou art my God. Let the lying lips be put in si- to silence, which speak grievous things proudly and contemptuously against the righteous. Thou shalt hide them in the secret of thy presence from the pride of man. Thou shalt keep them secretly in a pavilion from the strife of tongue. That is a prophecy of the coming rescue, the coming escape of Christians that are living right. Those that are in the way of the devil, the Bible says they will let, they will hinder till they be taken out of the way. And God will deliver them up from the strife of tongues. The strife of tongues? That means in the last days, right before the translations, when two will be in one bed and one will be taken in the other left, two will be in the field, one will be taken the other left. Right in the last days, when the Antichrist is about to come to power, you will have a climate of false accusation against the righteous like you have never seen before until the Lord rescues. There's many ways the Lord rescues, but Enoch was preaching away and he was hated by that first world. The Bible says he, he walked with God and the Lord took him and he was not. Go through the Psalms. I don't have time to cover all of them, but notice what it says. Psalms 120, Deliver my soul, O Lord, from lying lips and from a deceitful tongue. What shall be given unto thee? Or what shall be done unto thee, O thou false tongue? God has a judgment coming for you. Jeremiah, just like David, experienced false accusation. Look at Jeremiah 9. Oh, you know what's sad about all these psalms? Who reads their Bible? How could you go condemn men so easy without a trial? How could you go not give due process when you have right here in the Bible, just, on, just about everywhere you look, godly men like Daniel and David and Jeremiah and our Lord Jesus and Paul and Stephen, all throughout the Bible, whoever was righteous, whoever was letting their light shine, were falsely accused in the most hideous, slanderous way. And you got wicked people out there. Men with no backbone, sleazy men, sleazy people, slimy people. And they give ear to these things, see. They like it because they want to believe it. Maybe they're secret sodomites. Maybe they're secret adulterers. Who knows what the problem is in their own heart, why they want to believe these things so quickly. Jeremiah says, Oh, that I had in the wilderness a lodging place of wayfaring men that I might leave my people and go from them, for they be all adulterers and assembly a treacherous man, deceitful man, and they bend their tongues like their bow for lies. Jeremiah says, I cannot believe what they're saying against me. Take ye heed every one of his neighbor. Trust you not in any brother, for every brother will utterly supplant, and every neighbor will walk with slanders. It's sad when Jeremiah has to look around and says, Who can I trust? Who can I trust not to betray me? I'm going to tell you a secret right now. Very few in this day and age can you trust to give you due process. Very few. Very few in your own family. Very few possibly in your church. Possibly among your very friends. You just wait. Every godly man, just about, that has ever done anything for God and gotten in the way of the devil to whatever degree has had accusations come upon him. It goes with the Christian life. Our Lord Jesus assured us. They said, whatever they did to me, they're going to do to you, said the Lord. And you will find at that time that very few people, very few, will give you any benefit of the doubt any due process at all, even hear the matter because they want to believe evil against you. 
You say, why? Why? Because of your standards. Because of what you stand for. And they will deceive everyone his neighbor and will not speak the truth. They have taught their tongue to speak lies and worry themselves to commit iniquity. Jeremiah says in chapter 20, I've heard the defaming of many. Fear on every side. Report, say they, and we will report it. Hey, tell me something about Jeremiah. I'll put it in the news. Tell me something about him. Hey, what have you heard? Did you know Jeremiah when he's young? What about when he was a teenager? Have you seen Jeremiah do anything? J- just give me a report and I'll go report it. Bunch of sodomites. Bunch of adulterous, wicked, treacherous people. Psalms 27, deliver me not over into the will of my enemies, for false witnesses are risen up against me. (laughs) All of these songs, all these psalms, read through them. I've read them forward and backwards and forward and backwards. And I tell you what, I went through stages of my life where they started making sense. And if they haven't made sense to you yet, it's coming, unless you're hiding your light. You'll find out why you need these psalms. And you'll find out, wow, these are the songs. These are songs. False witnesses have risen up against me. Proverbs 19, a false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. I'm telling you, you better beware if you're a false witness. You better beware. You're headed for trouble. God cannot lie. God cannot lie. You're in trouble. It says in Matthew 26, Now the chief priests and elders and all the council sought false witness against Jesus to put Him to death. They wanted false witnesses. 1 Peter says, Having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. They say, Hey, so-and-so has been accused of so-and-so. Oh, wow, he must be godly then. Oh, no, no, but, but there's multiple explanations, uh, multiple allegations. Well, he must be really godly. Does that mean there's no hypocrites? No, there's certainly hypocrites. But I'm going to give due process to a righteous man. W- with all of these scriptures, and we're living in the last days, I'm going to give due process to a righteous man. A politician, a preacher, or any brother or sister in Christ. I'm going to give due process. Whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation and cry. In other words, Peter says, well, it's just normal. It comes with the territory. It comes with the job. It comes with our role in Christ Jesus. You're going to be falsely accused. You're already being falsely accused. You know what they were saying of Christians back then? They were saying that, you know that thing they call the Lord's Supper when they get together? They're eating babies. That's what they spread around. So when they persecuted Christians and they fed them to the lion, some people would say, you know, these people look like good people. They look like really sweet, kind people. No, they're, they eat babies. They're just cannibals. Go ahead and feed them to the lion. They're just wicked people. See, they were falsely accused. They were fa- but they're very Lord. They put out pictures of God as a donkey, as a donkey head. They, they, they accused Christians of being ignorant fools. And what they said... Do you remember John the Baptist? John the Baptist came preaching and they said, he has a devil. He has a devil. And then the Lord Jesus, they said, he's a drunkard and a glutton. And they spread that all around. Oh yeah, he's a, you you follow Jesus? I, I heard he's a drunkard. I heard he's a glutton. None of it was true. Not a word of it was true. But people refused to believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ They refused to follow John the Baptist's ministry because of the false accusation. And where did the accusations come from? The establishment. The establishment. The powers that be know how to manipulate the people. How in the world can Christians sit here with their Bible, with their very Lord crucified on the basis of false accusation, with just about every righteous person in the Bible... uh, Falsely accused. And then the Bible telling you in the last days it will happen in great abundance. How can you sit there in this day and age and not give due process to a brother or sister in Christ? Unbelievable! 
The Apostle Paul, just in case you missed it in the rest of the Bible, was falsely accused. Acts 24. But he stood up for himself. And he says, Neither can they prove the things whereof they now accuse me. Praise God. Hey, Paul, I heard you did this. I heard you did that. Paul says they can't prove any of it. Let them come to my face and tell me. Have you heard it? Oh, I heard what they said. Well, have you heard my side of it? God forbid. You know, the Bible says, Paul says, everybody in Asia forsook me. Only Luke is with me. What happened? False accusation about a good man of God who wrote much of the Bible. Somebody said, oh, I heard so-and-so is... And then they fill in the blank. Who knows what in the world they're coming up with? You can't keep up with it all. As a preacher that has stood against Sodomites for the family, for the King James Bible, for every restoration God has called me to restore, the fear of God, whatever it is in this day and age, if God gives it to me, I want to preach it. I'm willing to preach it. God help me. I ask that whatever you choose to believe about me, that you get my side of things. And not only that, but you bring my accusers before me. Tell them to come before me and meet me face to face. Give me due process. Let me cross-examine my accusers. And who are my accusers? What have they done? What have they been caught doing? Who are they? I'm not here to defend myself, but there are good godly men right now running for office that are being accused. Let them prove the things that they accuse. Men such as Judge Roy Moore. Let them prove those things. Forty years ago, a few weeks before a major election And you're going to come out with these reports. He did this 40 years ago. That's to be expected. Leader of the Tea Party says, I've had this happen to me. If you've never had this happen to you, then you must not be doing anything. So the leaders of the Tea Party said, hey, I know what he's going through. This is happening to me. Preachers like me say, I know what he's going through. I've been there. Some of you brothers and sisters, you've been there. You know what that feels like. See, and you're willing to give. Benefit of the doubt, you're willing to give due process because you know what it's like. But shame on those. And some of these wicked, I call them coins, because I believe they're conservatives only in name, Christians only in name, and they're doing it for money, usually coin. But I'm going to tell you something here. Some of those rhinos that sit up there, Republicans in name only, that have attacked and come out, against Roy Moyes. I just believe it. A drop of a hat, I believe it. Now they're getting accused. Many of them, now they're getting their own accusations. They're like, whoa, whoa. The Bushes, you know, all these Bushes, they're they're getting accused of being sleazy and all of these things. Wow. Do you want due process? You better give it to others. Psalms 101, I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. A froward heart shall depart from me. I will not know a wicked person. Whoso privily slandereth his neighbor, him will I cut off. I believe that's David talking as the king, and I believe that's God talking. God's going to cut off the slanderer. Sooner or later, God will cut you down. I tell you, the backbiter. Proverbs 6 says, These six things does the Lord hate. Seven are an abomination unto him. A false witness that speaketh lies is one of them. And he that soweth discord among brethren. There, there's some folks uh, that just can't wait to just go. And, you know, you've got to train your kids from an early age. Don't, don't be trying to get people in trouble. Don't, don't be trying to paint things in a certain way where you sow discord. Some people are just attention getters, you know. And they really love to just stir up things, you know. They'll split families, split a church. They learn from the time they're a child. They they go away, speak. they, They get out of the womb speaking lies and learning how to divide and sow discord and falsely accuse and be tattletale. And you gotta whip that stuff out of your kids and teach them and train them. Stephen, the first martyr, other than 
John the Baptist, but in, in our Lord. Look at it, it says, Acts 6, and Stephen, full of faith and power. Uh-oh! I know what's coming. If he's full of faith and power, they were not able to resist the wisdom and spirit by which he spake. Uh-oh! What do they do? Step number one, they suborn men. That means persuaded or purchased. Which said, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. Okay, that's first step. You pay men to be false accusers, men or women. Number two, and they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes. So now they get everybody stirred up in a frenzy. In verse 13, they set up false witnesses. They continue the pattern. Well, you don't believe that there's hypocrite preachers? Oh, yes, I do. Oh, yes, I do. You don't believe there's hypocrite politicians? Oh, yes, I do. <laughs> yes, I do. Wow. <clears throat> they know what to say sometimes to get elected. Just the other day, I was very saddened to hear a legislator in Ohio that presents himself as a Christian, pro-family, and conservative who's spoken out against the homosexual agenda, has been caught with a, a man. And he came out and confessed. This isn't hearsay. He confessed it, reportedly. Are there hypocrites? Yeah. Oh, yeah. But who are you to just up and believe something without due process. Especially against somebody who's not just saying what they are, but they're proving it. See, their works match their testimony. I believe those that have accused Roy Moore so quickly and believe the accusation. Without due process, I believe it exposes more about these people than they realize. I watch some of these news commentators, some of these people that have websites, you know, and some of these news websites, and you see who is willing to believe the accusation so quickly. National Review. All of these fake Republicans fake conservatives. Some of these people might be homosexuals themselves. I don't know. What, what is it about their life? Why would you believe something so quickly? What is it about Roy Moore that you don't like? What does he stand for that makes you angry? These are questions. Churches are filled today with the spirit that's led by propaganda. Just in my Little neck of the woods, I have experienced it firsthand. I can only imagine what somebody in the position of Roy Moore will face. I'm not going to go through everything, but I'm just going to tell you a little bit. I know what it's like. We decided we're going to be a church that stands. For decades, we went out and preached every weekend to drunkards. We preached to the homosexuals at the homosexual parades. We did everything we could to stand against evil that was happening in Fort Worth. Well, J. Frank Norris, back in the early days of the 20s and 30s, he stood up against the drunkards and the gamblers. Now we're having to stand up against men dressed like women. What in the world happened? But we're going to stand. We're going to stand against abortion. We do what we can. So we began to go downtown and witness against these parades, rebuke this. They had little children in these parades, and we, we began to tell the little children, this is ungodly, this is not right, this is sick, and I cannot believe the perverted things they're doing in front of these children. Then they had the mayor drive in a car and participate with this transvestite, Frankenstein-looking thing in the car. And they all said, this is wonderful, this is wonderful. I said, no, it's not, this is wrong. We've had one fella cry and want to repent of his lifestyle. We're there to be a witness to the children, to get in the way of the devil. And I could not believe the accusations that were made 
against me and folks in my church. The lies were unbelievable. There were sodomites in the police force. They began to lie. The police began to lie. It went all the way to the highest Texas court and was petitioned before the Supreme Court. And their lies influenced the judgments against me. And that case, I believe, was a very, very important case for free speech in America. One officer stated, basically what happened, you're at a homosexual parade, and they wait to the big party at the end of the parade, and they didn't want me messing up their party. They wanted to have a time of celebration, and they didn't want to have that time when they all congratulate one another and hand join in hand, they make themselves feel better. They didn't want me or any of the folks in our church standing up and, and, and preaching the Word of God to them. So a police officer gets in my way and says, everybody can go but you. And uh, I said, what do you mean everybody can go but me? Am I being detained? They said, no. You can go anywhere, but you can't go down here. I said, it's a public sidewalk. And then I asked the fellow next to me, are you a Christian? He said, yeah. And they allow him to walk down the sidewalk. I said, wait just a second. You're not allowing me to walk down the sidewalk? So the first year, I just walked through the police line. They didn't arrest me. Well, they set me up the next year. They knew by the next year that what I would do. So again, they blocked me again. And again, when I walked through the police line, they arrested me. Well, when I went to court, a uh, local uh, court there in Fort Worth, the officer said that I used disorderly language. And he thought I might use the same language later to incite violence. In other words, I said, you know, if you're going to allow lesbians to control you and you're going to basically just deny your conscience, you might as well put a bow in your hair. And... Um, he claims I called him a word that I did not call him. See? But he claims, okay, well, he might incite violence later. You, what, do you, what do you mean I might incite? You can't stop somebody on a public street, interrupt their First Amendment religious free speech liberties. You cannot deny their free speech based upon what you think they might do. Then one of these lesbian police officers testified. That yes, they were violent the previous year. What violence? They accused us of words that we never said. Horrible words. Then they said, we initiated a fight. This is what they used against me in court, folks. Been preaching 20 years. Never lifted a finger against anybody. Never had to. Knew how to diffuse situations, and by God's grace, God allowed it to be diffused. One year, a good brother went down for the first time, and he was preaching down there, and a homosexual slap, uh, uh, hit him in the face. The godly brother did not strike him back. Then the homosexual says, I'm going to jail, I'm going to jail, and began to panic and lose his mind. And what they did was claim, we had witness, we, we could prove this, but what they did was they accused us of violence. This is what happens because the lesbians joined together, see. So this thing, they convict us in lower court, it goes to the next court of appeal, and they said, no, you can't do this to these preachers. Then it went to the highest court of Texas. And you know what they did? They began to bring up, are you going to allow people like this that are violent? They don't just go downtown and exercise free speech. They're violent people. Look what these horrible things they're saying. And it caused people that are commenting. It caused the judges themselves to say, yeah, you're right. We can't allow this to be free speech. There's got to be a limit. You can't yell fire at a theater. There's got to be a limit on free speech. If they're inciting violence, then and he did disobey the police officer, so maybe we're just... And so these judges joined together based upon lies. Not one judge says, maybe we better... I'll tell you what. Maybe we better make sure they really incited violence. Maybe we better make sure this preacher really said these things. What's the evidence that he even said these things? No, no, I didn't get due process. So media organization, 
praise God for the uh, American Family Radio. They uh, presented our situation, gave us media coverage, and a few other godly media news platforms. But I was so shocked. The Christian media, that w the conservative media, that would not give us a platform. You know why? I believe because they looked at this thing, they said they're street preaching. That's not popular. Not only that, look at the things that they're being accused of saying. We're not going to give them any media coverage. So you're going to believe lies against me? You're not going to call me up and ask me, did y'all really say these things? So praise God, one judge said, now wait a minute. After a gay pride parade, police stop members of the church and no one else from walking down a public street. The police do this because they think that the, the views expressed by the group during the parade are hateful. Quotation marks. And because at the parade a year earlier, a different member of the church assaulted a gay man. This cannot be right. The First Amendment protects freedom of speech, even speech that is hateful. This person believed the things against us, but said it's still ridiculous even if they're true. <laughs> you know? Wow. How much more is it true if not any of the things they accused us of are true? Other than we said that sodomy is not biblical, it'll send you to hell, and you need to believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. That's the hate speech that they don't like, see? Folks, I've had the sodomite crowd. I've had the adulterous crowd. I've had the wicked come against me like you would not believe. I've had the Jezebel spirit come against me. And what that I understand. I understand that they're going to come against me. The thing that bothers me most are the Christians that are so quick to believe things about their brothers. So quick to throw Judge Moore under the bus. Well, he has accusers. I believe the accusers. What right do you have to believe the accusers against a righteous man without due process? What right do you have? If you get in the way of Satan, if you hinder the Antichrist spirit, if you seek to restore the foundations, all the legions of darkness will come against you. But shame on those that will not be a faithful friend. Hey, I believe faithful are the wounds of a friend. I believe that you need to rebuke your own friend, if need be, if he's in sin, and not enable him or her. But I also believe part of being a friend is you don't just start believing things against your brother or sister. You say, I know this man. What do you say he did? You know what my friend said in all my accusations? Go get the accuser and bring them. Whoever's accusing my friend, go get the accusers and let me hear this face to face. People that I thought were friends believe things. And year after year after year, not one phone call. When you enable false accusation, you are cursing people and you are becoming like them. Spurgeon says the detestable nature of slander, hurting three persons at once, the speaker, the hearer, and the person slandered. God says in Psalms 15, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor. Not only is tell, tell bearing wrong, but tell hearing is wrong. You know what these wicked people said? They said, I didn't, I'm not the accuser, I'm just repeating it. Shame on you. I'm going to show you from the Bible, there is not much difference between those who utter the slander and those who hear the slander. It's just the flip side of the same coin. 
Let me prove that to you from the Bible. Psalms 52. Thou lovest all devouring words, O thou deceitful tongue. Mean people that are willing to slander against others will hear slanders against others. You're revealing what type of character you are. If you're a slanderer yourself, you will hear slander. If you are a tell-bearer, you will be a tell-hearer and vice versa. If you want to see it in a more clearer way, look at Proverbs 17. A wicked doer giveth heed to false lips, and a liar giveth ear to a naughty tongue. There it is. How can you say it any more better than that? You heard those lies and failed to give due process because you're a liar yourself. You've revealed it. You've revealed it. You've got a lying heart. Otherwise, you wouldn't have believed it. People say, I have no reason to not believe an accuser. What are the characters of the accusers? And what are the characters of the accused? Start there. Paul said, even when he had good characters telling him something about bad characters, he says, I partly believe it. But I'm not going to depend upon this. I'm going to seek this thing out. How can you believe anything until you hear the matter fully? And why not give a righteous man the benefit of the doubt until he has given a defense and cross-examined his accusers face to face? Proverbs 18 says, He that answereth the matter before he hears... The accusers won't go. Well, then drop it. You have no business even receiving an accusation if the accusers will not go through due process. Look at Proverbs 18. He that answereth the matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame unto him. Oh, well, we, we have an annual where he said, Merry Christmas, and you're a sweet, pretty girl. And so, see, see, so he must have done all these things. Really? When Judge Moore asked for the annual to be presented to an expert, they won't give it up. The lawyer said, well, I don't even know if it's, if it's authentic. It doesn't matter anyway. Because you know why it doesn't matter anyway? Because it's not about truth. It's about feeling. It's about emotion. It's about creating a feeling about somebody. That's all they care about. That's what propaganda is. It's not about facts. It's about creating feeling. It's about stirring up the people. See, bad news travels like wildfire. Good news travels slow. He that answers the matter before he hears it, it's folly and shame unto him. Nicodemus says in John 7, standing up for the Lord Jesus in whatever little way he did at the time, Doth our law judge any man before it hear him and know what he doeth? They answered and said unto him, Art thou also of Galilee? Are you one of these ignorant people? Search and look, for out of Galilee arises no prophet. They say, You know what we got against him? The Messiah is supposed to be born in Bethlehem. He's not born in Bethlehem, he's a false prophet, dude. Hey, guess what? He was born in Bethlehem. But it went out because he was raised in Galilee. They thought that he was born in Galilee. But nobody ever checked. Because see, facts, you have to take some time. See, it's easy to believe lies, but what about the facts? Wait a second. One little fact can change everything. One little fact. He was born in Bethlehem. If Nicodemus had known that, he could have responded back. You've heard it said that a mouth of two or three witnesses... Uh, a man is to be condemned. And this is what many people seem to think today in Christian churches. Well, I heard more than two people say something against him. No, no, no. Well, well stop. You are not understanding the Word of God. It didn't say if you... Any preacher can find more than two homosexuals that will accuse him of something. What in the world are you doing? That doesn't mean if you could just find two people. It means for the same crime, if you could find two or three that are willing to make a formal charge and come before and be cross-examined by the accuser or his attorney and in a due process of court, uh, whether church court or civil court, can end up arriving at the truth. If the accusers are willing to come forth and after cross-examination... That's what the Bible is saying. That's what It doesn't say... You know what people think? They say, Oh, I heard so-and-so did so-and-so. 
They put it out on Facebook and they call up somebody and they text them. And they say, okay, have you heard the other side yet? Well, no. Well, you're wicked. You're wicked from hell and that's where you're going. But then there's these people and they think they're smart and they say, no, no, I've called up so-and-so too and I've heard both sides. And so you think you're intelligent. You think you're being godly. You're more godly than the first fellow, but you're still ignorant. Because what God's saying is, you don't know truth until you put the people down in front of you. I know it as a pastor. He said, she said, she said, he said. It's amazing what people tell me over the phone over the years. And then I go to the fella or whatever it might be and say, did this happen? And, and, and I'm like, okay, put you both right here before me. And you put them both before you. And I said, now, now tell me what you said. And then all of a sudden it all evaporates. And he responds and he says, that's not what, what? And I'm like, okay. If I had not put you both right before me and heard cross-examination of each other, I might have believed this thing. See? Cross-examination discovers the truth. But if a person says, oh, I will not be cross-examined, then shut your mouth. If you will not be cross-examined, shut your mouth. And whoever believes you, they need to shut their mouth and shut their ears. The Bible says that the backbiter is to be met with an angry countenance. And this is what needs to happen in this day and age. Oh, I'm telling you. Proverbs 18 says, He that is first in his own cause seemeth just, but his neighbor cometh and searcheth him. That means he doesn't just say, no, that's not what happened. He means he sits down and says, oh, is this what happened? Tell me. And they begin to explain and ask questions, and all of a sudden the people listening to the cross-examination say, oh, man, the story is actually upside down. It's actually opposite from what I was hearing. Judge not according to appearance, says our Lord, but judge righteous judgment. The appearance of things. It seems this is wicked. It seems this man is evil. It seems this woman is evil. Well, it's got to go through, process. It's got to go through due process. Exodus 23 says, Thou shalt not raise a false report. Put not thy hand with the wicked to be an unrighteous witness. That's what they're doing today. Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. Neither shall thou speak. In a cause to decline after many to rest in judgment, keep thee far from a false matter. There's some people who want to get in the middle of it as quick as they can, see. They want to support false accusers. William S. Plummer says the motto of the slanderer is, well, just heap on reproach. Some of it will stick. <laughs> you just make a whole bunch of accusations, somebody will believe something. And that's the climate we're living in today, folks. You get accused of something. They'll destroy your life. They'll destroy your business. They'll destroy your ministry. You know why? Because people have lost due process. They've lost these basic Christian principles that people used to get taught in Sunday school. They don't have this anymore. So if their neighbor is accused, they believe it to some degree. Let's see. So, well, what about the accusers? Shouldn't they be believed? It depends. It depends. You get 40 years later, you're going to all of a sudden, right before an election, come out in such an important election as this. You're going to come out uh, 40 years later and make an accusation. Oh, I tell you what, yes, I tend to doubt that. Yes, I do. Acts 25, to whom I, to whom I answered, it is not the manner of the Romans to deliver any man to die before that which is accused for that which he is accused, have the accusers face to face and have license to answer for himself concerning the crime against him. This is Roman law, brother John. This, these are the Gentile. The Gentile says, I'm not going to believe something against a man until I hear him cross-examine the accusers. If you don't hear somebody cross-examine the accusers, you're wicked. You're worse than a Gentile. Family Bible notes, to condemn a man unheard without his being permitted to meet and examine his accusers face to face is the essence of tyranny and must be condemned by the judgment and common sense of the whole world. 1 Timothy 5 says, against an elder, that's a pastor, receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. See, Pastor Timothy, as the head pastor, would have assistant pastors. Perhaps many of them, depending upon how big the church is. <laughs> and all of a sudden, <coughs> one of his men are accused. Paul says, 
make sure two or three people saw it. What? What type of protection for a man? What if he's really guilty? Well, God will deal with it because you're not living in a perfect world right now. See? But the Bible is going so far to protect a pastor in his office because he's going to have people hate him. He's going to be rebuking people. He's going to be dealing with rebellious people that sometimes kick back and bite back at you. And uh, you've got to protect your pastors. You've got to protect a man in office from false accusation. So you had to go through this rigorous process. And one of the things that you had to do is you had to have two or three witnesses before you even receive it. Before you even receive the accusation. As Matthew Henry and all the old preachers said, this accusation is not to be received unless supported by two or three credible witnesses. And the accusation must be received before them. That is, the accused must have the accusers face to face. Because the reputation of a minister is in particular manner a tender thing. And therefore, before anything be done in the least to blemish that reputation, great care must be taken that the thing alleged against him be well proved. So a church is to say, Brother Conrad, there have been some accusations. And we have two witnesses coming forth to say they saw you drinking alcohol the other night and that you were drunk. But Brother Conrad, I love you, and I'm not about to believe this, though I don't understand what these witnesses saw. But I'm not going to judge by appearance. So I'm going to have you sit right here. We're going to have a church court, and I'm going to let you cross-examine these witnesses. You go ask them anything you want. Demand. See. And you might find out that the brother is guilty, or you might find out that one of those brothers is very angry at Brother Conrad because Brother Conrad has been preaching something in his Bible class that they're very, very angry about, see. Wesley said, this ought to direct our proceedings in all affairs, not only in public, but in private life. About our Lord Jesus, it says, neither so did their witnesses agree together. William Blackstone says in 1760, the great jurist, it is better that ten guilty persons escape than one innocent person suffer. John Adams, our founding father, said it's more important that innocence should be protected, that is, than guilt be punished. For guilt and crimes are so frequent in the world that all of them cannot be punished. History of the Sandy Creek Baptist Association in 1859 says an accusation is not to be entertained against any minister except it be established, established by two or three witnesses. Such is the credulity of man that too frequently credits criminal reports without sufficient testimony against God-fearing men. Oh, but Titus 2 says the aged women likewise that they be in behavior as becometh holiness. And when dealing with these aged women, the first thing it says is not false accusers. A lot of aged women coming against Judge Roy Moore. Some of them have some really bad character in their life. One of them's own son said she's a, she's a total 100% wicked liar that's out for the money. What do you do? See, I'm telling you something. That the Bible says that a preacher is to teach aged women that they better not be false accusers. Why would you go to deal with the fault of women, the first thing you deal with is false accusation? See, the Bible speaks of tattlers among women, that they need to get busy with their own children and quit being tattlers. God, God's dealing with Christian women, brother. God is saying one of the dangers of Christian women is that you become a tail hearer and a tail bearer and you start spread. You can split a church. You let one woman sit in a church. She, she can split an entire church. She can split marriages. She can split a church. Let's see. False accusers. AP News says Thursday's news conference was designed to send a powerful message to the political world. That's when Judge Roy Moore's wife stood up with a lot of other women from around the country and in Alabama. And praise God, it was quite a amazing. We watched some of it last night. The event also revealed an aggressive strain of homophobia, rarely seen in mainstream politics, in recent years at least. 
Moore's hero status among many Christian conservatives was cemented in 2016 when as the Chief Justice of the Alabama Supreme Court refused to comply with the Supreme Court ruling that legalized same-sex marriage nationwide. He was later suspended the second time he was forcibly removed from the state Supreme Court. Earlier this month, Moore said transgenders don't have rights. Folks, <laughs> preaching against Fort Worth sodomites? Look what they accuse me of? You become a national figure a national hero against the gay movement? They know what this man will do if he ever gets in the Senate. Not only that, they know that if Trump was elected because he stood up to the establishment, they know Roy Moore will bring the whole Christian world and conservative world into a fever and they'll elect him as president, see? They've got to stop this man at all costs. All costs. GOP leaders who threw fellow Republican Moore to the wolves stay silent on Dem Franklin. Franken. See, you've got all these Hollywood perverts also being exposed right now everywhere you look. And based on the movies they put out, you tend to believe these accounts. But they're entitled to due process too. But a lot of them are coming out and admitting it. They're like, yeah, yeah, I did this. Yeah, I did this. So this is looking bad because Hollywood has been putting out movies for years making Christians look like hypocrites and perverts and come to find out they're the perverts. Surprise. Who would have ever guessed? If you want to find out what movies you're showing your children, read a little bit about what the producers are doing in their private lives. Well, they got to balance that, see. They need something big in the news because everybody's looking at Hollywood and saying, you're a bunch of perverts. You're a bunch of pedophile perverts. So you got to balance that, see. We, we, we need one of the prominent Christian leaders to be accused so we can balance this thing, see. Because it's looking really bad for Hollywood right now, and they don't want to lose that power. But the main thing is they want to stop Judge Roy Moore, I believe, because of what he stands for. And not only what he believes and professes, but what he's proven in regard to his fruit. So yes, I will give Judge Roy Moore due process. And I will not immediately believe accusations from 40 years ago against a righteous man that is proven by his fruit to be godly. And people that have courted him 40 years ago have come forward People from 20 years ago, 30 years ago, they, they have all come forward and said he's a righteous, godly man. David Horowitz says this is political assassination, guilt by accusation. Rush Limbaugh says it's a search and destroy mission. It's really about Mitch McConnell, the fake Republican, sending a message to Judge Roy Moore. This is what I'm able to do to you. I've had people send me emails and says this is what I'm going to print. See? If you don't stop, this is what I'm going to print against you. An activist pastor. An activist pastor. What is an activist pastor? I don't even want to know. It's not activist in the way he should be, I'm sure. We have to challenge Roy Moore's religious positions. See, that's what's happening. That's what's happening. Sessions says, we have no reason to doubt more accusations. Really, you don't have any reason. Kayla Moore, Judge Moore's wife, says, The Washington Post has called everybody that I've ever known for the last 40 years. They have called everybody my husband has ever known in the last 40 years. They print whatever anyone says without checking to ever see if it's correct. To the people of Alabama, thank you for being smarter than they think you are. They will call you names. They will say all manner of evil against you. I would say, consider the source. Let me close by... Just giving you a couple of points here. I'm warning false accusers right now. But one of my main goals are for tell hearers, people that are so quick to believe ungodly things. And I'm telling you, you cause a great, great grief to many people. And you're going to be judged by God. He that taketh up a reproach unrighteously is going to be judged by God. You will not dwell in His holy hill. You will not enter the coming kingdom. 
Now, why does God allow such a thing? Oh, this is something. That preachers that have never experienced this, and they get to experience it for the first time, they say, why, Lord? Why don't you shut their mouths, God? And sometimes He does really quick. But sometimes He allows it just to continue. And you're like, God, the ministry is being hurt. Why do you allow this thing? Why do you allow people to do these things? Zephaniah Smith had a sermon called The Malignant's Plot in 1647. And here's his point, so I'm going to share with you, then pray. He says, let me tell you one reason why God allows false accusations against you in such grievous ways. First, God uses it to bring you closer to Him. You begin to walk closer to God. You begin to read those Psalms and understand them. The Word of God becomes meaningful to you in a way it hadn't before. You, you'd miss Jeremiah saying that his own familiars are betraying him. You'd miss how this thing runs throughout the whole Bible. You hadn't had fellowship with these men before. See, but now you're having fellowship with Job. You're having fellowship with these men in the Bible. So, Ze so, so uh, Zephaniah says that it brings you closer to God. He says, though you're not guilty of what they claim, you do draw closer to God and you do get refined and made a better person. Job was falsely accused by his friends. And he stood up for himself. And he, he basically rebuked him and says, you're all miserable physicians. Nevertheless, by the end of the book, Job says, God, I'd only heard you before, but now I see you and I repent. Though Job wasn't guilty of what those wicked men accused him of, and they were wicked, and they got in a lot of trouble before God. Job says the whole thing showed me things that I do need to fix in my life. That God used all of this. God used this trial to purify me. And David makes the same point. Second point is God uses it to make you pray more. Oh, that's true. It'll definitely reignite your prayer life. You get falsely accused, it will reignite your prayer life. Number three, God also uses it to keep you even further from the charges falsely claimed against you. Though you're not guilty of what they accuse you of, just the false accusation makes you get even further away from such a thing. So God uses it as a protection in your life. A purification in your life. And finally, God uses it to see if you'll cleave to Him in all conditions. Paul said that I might know Him, that I might have fellowship with His suffering. Well, if you're going to walk with Jesus in His sufferings, you've got to be falsely accused. Now you're walking with Jesus. This is what the Lord experienced. When the Lord went to that cross, they were spitting on Him as a criminal. When Paul went to prison, they said that he is a criminal against the state, a wicked man. And the last thing, and I close, oh, this is so important, God uses it to teach you how to respond to others when they are falsely accused. There's people, there's men and women standing with Judge Roy Moore right now that says, I know what you're going through, brother. I have been there, and I know what it's like. And I tell you, when you've had people do that to you, you've got a little more patience, a little more carefulness about what you believe because you've experienced it. You become wiser, more careful. Not to throw a brother under the bus, just by appearances. Dear Holy Father, we do pray that you will teach these children at a young age, God, to not have wicked lying tongues, to not be sowers of discord, to not be tale bearers and tale hearers, God, trying to stir up trouble. 
We do pray that you help them grow up honest, godly, young people that know and understand that being a Christian and standing for God is going to invite great hatred and the false accusations of the last days. Let them know it's going to be hard to stand for you, Lord. Let them learn at an early age. But let them know also, God, that you will defend them. Let them know, Father, that you will send your arrows to stand up and defend in your time. And that you will judge the false accusers. Help them wait on you and be patient, Lord. And God, I pray for all the Christians out there, Lord, that are so quick to believe and think that they have evidence, just like the Pharisees thought they had evidence against the Lord Jesus. God, that Your people will give due process. And we do pray right now for all those that are being falsely accused, whether in the pulpit, in their families, or in the legislature, <clears throat> that you would help them, Father. Be fighters. <clears throat> help them not be discouraged and throw in the towel because that's what their enemies want, Lord. Send many people, Father, to encourage them and refresh their spirits. as you've done to this preacher. In Jesus' holy name, amen.